How long? How long have you been in jail? Three years. Three years. Yes, sir. Okay, and that's a total of three years for having sex with a twelve-year-old, shooting two dogs, and being told not to have a firearm, but you went ahead and had one. Yes, sir. Okay, I don't have any other questions. Well, buckle up, because there's a new sheriff in town. The man asking the questions, a parole board member, was the sheriff for Louisiana for much of his career, now acting as a parole board member, and he's going to take on this parole hearing. And I think those are the two things that we just despise most, harming our children and harming our pets. He checks both boxes. Let's jump in. I'll unpack it at the end. Mr. Munez, state your name and DOC number for me, please. Christopher Munez, DOC number 744696. Okay. Mr. Munez, I'm going to read some uh, information into the record. If any of it uh, sounds like it's not true, just stop me and we'll try to get everything on the same page, okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Mr. Munez, you are a second felony offender. You were on for carnal knowledge of a juvenile, which was revoked when you were arrested for cruelty to an animal and possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. Uh, you were given a total of five years. Your parole date is 4-13-23. Your adjusted good time date is 6-2-26, and your full term date is 7-14-26. Does all of that information sound correct to you, Mr. Munez? Yes, sir. Okay. First off, Mr. Munez, tell us uh, what went on. Tell us about the coronal knowledge and tell us about the shooting of the dog incident. And then tell us why you think we should consider letting you out today. Yes, sir. Well, um, at the time I was 18 years old, I lacked a lot of knowledge. I was very ignorant to the situation. One day I ended up meeting, I seen somebody that I went to school with and that person that I went to school with just so happened to be with the victim. With that being said, me and the person that I went to school with ended up coming in an agreement. She said she wanted to hang out so we can catch up. She said the victim was going to come over with her. So, you know, I got to know the victim. The victim said that she was 18 years old. And, you know, it's like, this is just the worst mistake I ever made. You know what I'm saying? Because I didn't evaluate the situation, how I was supposed to do it. I didn't ask the proper questions to the FEMA in order for me to get to thoroughly know who she is, which is another place where I went wrong at. And it resulted in me getting the conviction of carnal knowledge of a juvenile. With the, uh, with the aggravated cruelty of an animal, there was an incident prior to that situation where I was hospitalized by these same dogs. Whenever I went to the hospital behind these dogs, I actually received puncture wounds because they attacked me. So at that time, I didn't decide to call the authorities because I felt as if if I did, nine times out of ten, it would have came back on me in a bad way. Like, the people weren't well, no good. They, their intentions weren't right. You know what I'm saying? So, basically, with that being said, it's like one day we came to the conclusion that it was time to move. When we were in the process of moving, I ended up bringing my dog down last. So, when I brought my dog downstairs, I ended up trying to bring him to the truck, to the U-Haul truck. With that being said, the neighbors had a couple of dogs in the lease. They ended up letting the dogs go. The dogs ended up attacking my dog. And eventually, that's when I ended up taking matters into my own hands because one got loose and tried to attack me again. And I ended up shooting the dog, which, which was a horrible mistake that I committed too. And I, I'm completely remorseful for the situation. I really wish I could take back what I did. But you know, I just all I could do is learn from, the, from, the, from this experience that I'm going through now. And I'm very, I'm very remorseful in every circumstance. Okay. All right, Mr. Munez, thank you for your statement. Uh, now we're going to hear from uh, the people that are in favor. Miss uh, Michelle Munez's sister. Hi, yes. Um, yes, well, I couldn't be more grateful for the opportunity that he's even here, eligible for um, possibly a parole. Um, if there's anyone that deserves a second chance, 
or even a third is definitely Christopher. And I know it might sound biased because it's my brother, but he's done everything he could do and he has stayed out of trouble. And I know, I'm sorry, I get emotional, how difficult prison can be. And I just, I want him to be home and protected. And I just, we just need him. And we just hope that he has a chance to be able to start his life and get his self back on track because I know it's in him and and he's he's the best person I know I mean I wouldn't take that I would take that to my grave um but yes I would appreciate any um any anything that we could do for him um we were there for him all the time and we'll always be there for him and we just we're praying for a good outcome today okay uh, thank you, Ms. Nunez. Uh, now we'll hear from Wilfredo Valarella, your brother. I, hey. So, I'm sorry. I, I'm, as well, very emotional. Um, it's very hard to see my little brother, baby brother, uh, in such a situation. It's very unfortunate. Um, I am very eager to have my brother back out in regular civilization. I would like to take him under my wing and, you know, I'm an automotive tech. I would like to help him learn a trade um, or help him find a trade that he wishes. I want to help him get back on track on life. Um, and just, it's, it's very hard to, um, for his unfortunate situations that, uh, I feel, you know, should have never happened. Um, I feel he was maybe a, a slightly alone or just, um, in other words, I wish I could have been there more as an older brother as well. But um, like I said, I, I, would, I would love to have him back out here and to help him progress himself as a young man to a mature adult. Um, yes, Your Honor. Um, I'm just, I'm just very hopeful today. Okay, I appreciate those comments. Uh, Ms. Sonia Munez, uh, your mother. We, we can't hear you, Ms. Munez. Okay, now? Huh? Yes, ma'am. Okay, sir. Um, okay, I speak a little bit English, not much. I don't know if you want my daughter to translate me when I want to say to you. Uh, that's up to you. If you think you can explain it, that's fine. If you want an interpreter, you can uh, have one. Okay. Um, okay. The, I try to do, you know, that I have been waiting for this moment, you know, um, Thinking in advance that my son, you know, can obtain in a um, obtain parole. I miss my son a lot, you know. Um, he's my youngest, you know. So, um, um, I can't wait. You know, I can't wait. Uh, get my family together again. Uh, it's Christopher. You know, I'm Christopher Mother. I know that he's capable of going out and facing life out there. Um, working hard to demonstrate to everyone and mailing to himself that he's capable of getting ahead with his life. Okay, thank you, and you did that very well, by the way. <laughs> I <you> try. <laughs> okay, okay, uh, Mr. Randall Myers. Uh, good afternoon, Randall Meyer, Assistant DA Jefferson Parish. We strongly oppose this to Munez's request. Um, he was 18 years old when he committed this crime. The child was 12. Uh, it's not like she was 16, close in age to him. She was six years younger than him, just a child. Uh, and that's that, there's no excuse for something like that. He has a moderate risk assessment high for antisocial thinking, substance abuse, mental health and depression, education, and total needs. Um, he was given a break in this case, as you noted, that he was placed on probation, but then revoked because of an additional offense 
in Orleans Parish. Um, only programs he's taken, Louisiana Risk Management Phase 1 in the Job Skills Program. I believe this is his third parole hearing. In both of his other parole hearings, I opposed him in part because he had no sex offender treatment. He still has had no sex offender treatment. We're strongly opposed to his request for parole. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Myers. All right. Well, uh, now I will uh, ask you a few questions, uh, Mr. Muniz, since I was assigned your case. Yes, sir. Okay, Mr. Muniz. You know, as as uh, Mr. Myers pointed out, she was 12. You had no idea she was 12? No, sir. When she was with the female, with the female that I went to school with, when she had told me she was 18, I really didn't think much of the situation because I didn't fully evaluate the situation myself in order to see that the girl was the age of 12. And, you know, that's, that's what I went wrong at. Okay. Did you know her before this, the victim? No, sir. Not at all. Okay. Uh, according to the arrest reports, uh, they they claim that your sister called uh, the victim and uh, asked her not to uh, wanting her to lie. Is that true? How would they? How would she get her number if you didn't know her? I'm not sure, sir. I don't want to lie to you. I'm not sure at all. Okay, um, and about the dog, uh, where did the gun come from? The gun, uh, uh, I, I had bought it from somebody on the streets. All right, and uh, I understand that the dogs uh, were attacking your dog and then they were gonna attack you and you shot them, correct? Yes, sir. Were you on any kind of drugs? Have you ever taken any kind of drugs? No, sir, no, sir. Okay. Um, do they offer sex offender treatment in Morehouse Parish? No, sir. Have you ever been any place where they offered the sex offender treatment? No, sir, not at all. I took uh, I took a sex offender class when I was on probation in the DMV. Correct. You, you used to have to go once a month, probably. Oh, uh, I think every Wednesday. Yes. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um. And what did you learn from that class? From the sexer from the class. Mm -hmm. I to make sure that I, I have anybody that I'm dealing with under any circumstance. Make sure I evaluate the person thoroughly. Always make sure that the person is the age that she says she is. Always make sure that she is a grown, a grown person, you know. And always making sure that I never surround myself in a. It, it goes like as far as like me making sure that I never put myself in a bad environment or anywhere to risk my life for freedom when it comes to anybody that's that's a female, you know. And it's it's been it's been very complicated. I, I never made the same mistake again. It's never happened again, and it never will happen again. Okay, you had one period of probation. Of course, that was revoked uh, for a new offense. Uh, well, where are you going to work if you get out? Well, I, I'll be working in New Orleans Furniture with a family friend named AJ. He actually has a job for me at Assembling Furniture at his warehouse. In my free time, I'll be working with my sister, uh, setting up uh, events. Okay. Uh, all right. And uh, who are you going to reside with? Um, I, I think you said you were homeless at the no, time. Sir. Of that, that's, okay, you were, you were at home. Okay. All right. So who, who are you going to reside with? Uh, I'll be residing by myself at 20. Louisiana. Okay. Um, we have no opposition from the victim because we were unable to locate her. And we were or her mother, because she is still a minor. So we uh try to contact the mother. Uh also uh the owner of the dog, we were unable to contact him. Uh 
Okay, uh, I have no further questions for him. Do either one of my board members have any questions, my fellow board members? I don't have any. Um, Mr. Prayer? How long, how long have you been in jail? Three years. Three years? Yes, sir. Okay, and that's a total of three years for having sex with a 12-year-old shooting two dogs and being told not to have a firearm, but you went ahead and had one. Yes, sir. Okay. I don't have any other questions. Okay. Uh, is the panel ready to vote? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'll be voting first, Mr. Munez, because uh, I've uh, been assigned your case. Um, I listen to you, and I think you have a lot of potential in your life. I really do. But, uh, you know, it, it, it is a fact, like the sheriff said, you received five years for two very, very heinous offenses. I mean, and you had a gun. That's the other thing that really concerns me. You had a gun, and you were on probation at that time. So my vote today will be to deny, but I will also recommend that we get you somewhere where sex offender treatment, uh, they have it. And as soon as you complete the treatment, you can reapply. Yes, sir. Uh, Ms. Renatza? I do agree. I, um, concerned for all the same reasons that's been stated, both by Mr. Prayer and Mr. Um, Freeman. And so my vote today is to deny with the recommendation that you be given the opportunity to do the uh, sex offender treatment to get you moved somewhere that offers it. Yes, ma'am. My vote also is to deny. Mine is also to deny. Um, a big, big thing is that you were told when you got a real break on the sex with a 12-year-old, you were told you can't have a gun. Yes, sir. And you went out and got a gun. You got to learn to abide by the rules like the rest of us. Yes, Thank sir. You. Good luck. Okay. Uh, today, uh, Mr. Munez, uh, your parole has been denied. Mr. Munez, I'm telling you, get your head straight. I think you can have a good life. You are a very young man, but you also are a second offender. Yes, sir. So, uh, just remember that. Okay. Yes, so good luck to you. Uh, your parole has been denied today. We are closing out from uh, Morehouse Parish at 12.05. I don't know who's worse, him or the family that supports him. And look, family, it's, what is the saying, blood thicker than water? And I get that. But you're not helping him. You, you, you know, we have seen people who are facing life without the possibility of parole. Their family is there hoping for a commutation after 30 years. And we have seen those family members give less faces and less hand wringing and less praying gestures. They're acting like the, like he was about to be put in the chair and the decision was on the board. It was just crazy. He's got a couple more years left to serve. Please. His full term date is 2026. Give me a break. You're not helping him. Do you get it? You're not helping him. You're enabling. You even find out here, and I assume it's the same sister we saw online. Maybe he has multiple sisters. We can't make assumptions. But I'm assuming it was her. They claim, there's allegations, that she called the victim and said, don't say anything then the victims are somehow unreachable. It's not helping. Hold him accountable. Look what happened. They gave him the deal of a lifetime because she's just a child, just 12 years old. You know, they gave him probation. Probation. For doing that to a 12 year old. All these years later, he shows up to parole and he still denies it, still has a still. Ran. And why? It's because he's surrounded by enablers. 
you know, thank goodness our reliable Randall Meyer, the assistant district attorney for his parish, shows up. He shows up to all his hearings. Apparently now he's using an avatar. He cloned himself. He's a robot. I don't know, a night bot competition or something. But he still shows up. And thank goodness, because we need someone to represent the victims. I, it's important. And you hear there in the medical thing that they bring up or the prison, they bring up that uh, that he is, uh, what was it, high tendencies for antisocial behavior? And it's like, no kidding. What do you think? He's out on probation. He's given a gift. He doesn't have to serve a day in prison. And he buys a gun off the street. And not only that, but he murders two dogs. Can you not see the telltale signs of a dangerous dangerous, dangerous man who is going to be getting out of prison 7-14-2026. Actually, that is less than two years from the day of this hearing. Someone who on probation, who has everything to lose, does something so disgusting to 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 basically 99.9% of the world's population after he's on probation for harming a 12-year-old he goes and kills two dogs and still he somehow only gets a 5-year sentence can we not see that this is the telltale signs of someone i think i'm not i'm no I'm no expert. I don't do the algorithm. You know, I'm not a PhD. But for me, this is scary. And the worst is that he's he's surrounded by enablers. He's given he he has a place to stay by his own. That was his exit plan. His sister wants him to work with her. I don't know, running events, events where I'm sure there'll be little girls. That just looks like, you know, that's a good guess. I mean, the whole thing is terrifying. And I can only think about what really happened. He, 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 he claims, you can't believe a word that comes out of his mouth. He claims, oh, yeah, the dogs were attacking me, so I shot. Yeah. Uh, uh, what type of joy did he get by tracking down those dogs and killing them, huh? I don't have any reports. I don't have anything to share with you. Nothing. There's nothing on this because, again, it's just a child. You would think that they would have had some type of article about the dogs. And then I know if you if you caught on, you heard how Mr. Randy Meyer spoke about other parole hearings. And normally what we do is we have a spreadsheet with every single parole hearing that's taken place. And Richard would match it up and I would have shown you those parole hearings leading up to this. We would have seen all of them, but we can't find them. They're not there. And there was one date that we had in the spreadsheet that he was supposed to show up on October of 2023 but it was postponed because they were doing the uh, death row commutations around then. So all, everything was pushed around. And, you know, he was only, Richard has in the notes here, it's funny, I, I, I see the name and I go to write an email to Richard, where's his other hearings? But he had already put a note in the spreadsheet that I missed, always one step ahead. He said, Six, since convictions and release dates are same, apparently, this roach got probation and sometime on or after April 21st, April 2021, had his parole violation for um, uh, and since not in any old vids or in parole violation list, he must not have contested his parole violation. So we didn't see his revocation hearing, but I don't know. It could be Randy was mistaken about attending his prior parole hearings or he saw it on the list I, or it's possible we met we 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 messed up um we we literally have thousands and thousands and thousands of names in this spreadsheet so but if we find it i'll play it for you again we'll do we'll we'll put it together um there's a playlist called return of if you're not familiar with playlist that's where i mark so if you want to see commutation hearings you go to the commutation hearings we have female only playlist we have return of playlist so this way it gets organized we have the roach playlist um this one you know every once in a while we, we get a hearing that just kind of sh sends a shiver down my spine and this is one of them this is a scary person in my opinion not just because of the natures of his crime because of the antisocial 
um, diagnosis, if you will, but also being surrounded by pure enablers. It's just a recipe for disaster and we're seeing the results of it. And with that, let's jump into the next hearing. We're here to hear Milton Falk Faulkner. Mr. Faulkner, you are a fourth felony offender. You have a parole date of 7223. You're not eligible for good time. You have a full term date of 1225. You had a two year sentence for possession of meth. Does that sound correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Faulkner, I want you to tell me, uh, tell me what was going on in your life at that time. Why were you doing meth? And, uh, why should we, uh, consider letting you out today? Well, I was, um, taking on um, what they call X pills. And the kind of job I had, it was long hours, so I really was taking it to stay up. All right, and why do you think we should let you out today? Uh, I feel like I learned my lesson. You know, I've been um, going through a lot, like with my kids, my family. My um, my fiance, she died five days after she had my son, so he stuck out there really. You know, my kids need me. And I have a job waiting on me. I go back to my job if I do get out working at Avondale Shipyard at Host Terminal. And um, is that all you uh, wish to say, Mr. Falcon? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, on your behalf, we have Miss Sarah Faulkner, your mother. Miss Faulkner, do you wish to give a statement? Good, good morning. Yes, I will. Okay. Um, I think he he will be commendable of coming out to what his job. He has a baby that he needs strictly need to come to take care of. Also, because like he said, his fiance died a week after birth, and it's been hard on the family, everything, especially with me. Because the people that he's staying, that he, the baby is staying with, is with his sister and a family that she, and I don't get to see my grandbaby. The last time I see my grandbaby was when he was out, and which he tried to give me full custody of it, but I wouldn't do it that way. But I, and then he has a job waiting on him, and he needs to come out to support his kids that he have, and. I'm 100% supportive. I didn't know that other people could get on the line that was asking me about it, but they are on YouTube at this time also. And he does have family support. He has someone somewhere to stay at. I'm 100% behind him that God would guide him and lead him in a direction to take care of his kids. And his job is waiting on him also. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Faulkner. Uh, uh, Mr. Randall Myers from uh, Jefferson Parish DA's office. Okay, sorry about that again. Problems getting that so we all can hear me. Um, I'm opposed at this time in looking at what he's been doing while he's been incarcerated. Um, I don't see any programs that he's taken. Um, he's a poor supervision when he was out. He was on parole out of Mississippi when he committed the offense that we have here today. He was in a high set program and was released or discharged out of that, removed out of that uh, back in January because of disciplinary problem. However, apparently he didn't get a write-up, which did not result in him being removed from this hearing today. 
Um, and he's got an outstanding attachment, an active attachment for him out in Mississippi, but his parole violation there. So for those reasons, we're opposed to his request for our parole. Uh, Mr. Prater, you've been assigned his case. Do you have any questions for Mr. Faulkner? Sir, what was the deal about the high set discipline? Well, Why? I never got into no trouble. I was in a camp that I was asking to get in classes, and I was taking my GED, but um, they moved me because I was trying to get in like other classes and. They was letting offenders go before me because I was flat time. And they was telling me that I couldn't take other classes. And um, a situation happened where they wanted me to tell them something that I seen, but I didn't see and I didn't have knowledge of. So they shipped me and I was supposed to be work release eligible, but I couldn't go because of the detainer. But I didn't get in no trouble. Because why, why was that? They love to take good time and do disciplinary. That's the main thing to do. So they like to take discipline and good time from you, huh? Yeah. So if that, if I was a problem, they would have made sure I went in front disciplinary board. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I'm looking, you're a fifth fifth felony offender. Is that correct? Fourth. Fourth? Well, I wrote down fifth. I don't know. Maybe somebody got something. Uh, anyway, that's a lot. Uh, it seemed like that you had had a lot of problems with, with breaking the law and different things. Uh, how do we, how can we trust that you're not going to get out and do the same thing? You hadn't been in that long. I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. No. I had a problem with, you know, taking drugs. And I learned my lesson. You know, yeah. like more important, like my family, I have things that I have to do, like as far as my kids, they need me. It is over, but, you know, if, if even if y'all was to let me go or not, you know, I learned my lesson. You know, I'm a man, so I have to accept what come with it. You know, I understand what I did. And the consequences that come with it, but it's over with. I can't leave my kids like that again. Well, yeah, prison is a it, it, prison is a, a problem. It's uh, it gets in the way of a lot of things. Yes, uh, but that doesn't mean that you're ready to get out. Uh, that that's all I got. Mr. Rossi, do you have any questions? Yeah, I just wanted to ask, how much time do you owe Mississippi? I was on, I had two years left on parole in which I guess the parole officers said that I abscound with saying that I wasn't living in a place that I was and my mother could tell you. Right, so I, how much time do you still owe them? About a year or two. Okay, that's all I got. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, is the panel ready to vote? Yes, sir. Okay, Mr. Prater, you'll go first since uh, it was your case. Okay, I'm my vote today is to deny um, because of his criminal record, and it appears that he says he's learned his lesson because he needs to get out, but I don't know that he has. And uh, and and anyway, my vote is to deny. Uh, Renata. Um I, I agree. Uh, my vote today is to deny because of the opposition expressed here uh, today. Okay. Uh, my vote is also to deny. Uh, parole has been denied today, Mr. Faulkner. You'll get out in January. So is that, uh, that'll be our closing out uh, at 11.35 from Bayou Dorchette. Thank you. I mean, he gave them nothing to work with. I don't know. It's you might say on one hand, hey, what he had possession of this narcotic, why he should serve two years for that. But again, he's a multi level offender. He's got felonies in other states. He's in Mississippi. He couldn't even answer what how much time he had one or two years left 
to serve there. It just wasn't a hearing that they could give him anything, not to mention um, it, it was just a bad hearing. He needed an attorney. I think that could have maybe helped with something, but I don't know what I just saw. And he has a prior history of, of dealing, and uh, that could have had something to do with it. And then he has many different appeals. We're not going to go over them. We're just going to jump into another hearing. But Richard uh, found it that he's he has not made friends while locked up. He has, I think we have three or four lawsuits against the DOC. This one, for example, is um, the plaintiff state uh, detainee filed a pro se and in informa, blah, 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 civil rights complaints. He sued Orleans Parish Sheriff. Marlin Guzman and other identified defendants in his lawsuit plaintiff claims he was combined in unsanitary conditions in the Orleans Parish prison system. And, you know, it, I guess what's interesting is, is all of these lawsuits, like there's a lot of them, I can just do this and there's this one and there's this one. And I, he just didn't give me that impression. He didn't... <clears throat> handle himself well uh, in, in front of the parole board. He didn't give them anything to work with. I can't imagine. It's it's Imagine suing the sheriff where you're detained, and it's just, that seems so scary. I mean, I just, I know there's not supposed to be retribution, but I feel like there's going to be. That's got to take a different level of, because you're not going to win. Anyways. Let's move to the next hearing. What about your best friend who said you did punch him? Okay. Excuse me? Whoa. I don't know if he's going to want to consider him his best friend anymore because he is backing serious time. He's out on manslaughter, and his full term date is 2033. So he is nine years riding on this parole revocation hearing. Let's jump in. Okay, uh, are you Mr. Gregory Howard? Yes, sir. Mr. Howard, we're here today for your revocation hearing. Uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to read the violations. You'll plead guilty or not guilty with a statement or without a statement. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Okay, and then I've been assigned your case, and I will ask you some questions since uh, you have no one here to speak for you. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Okay, did you complete your parole questionnaire? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, all right, so it stated you were not el eligible for appointed counsel. Are you ready to proceed today? Yes, sir. Okay, all right, uh, Mr. Howard, on 11-30-2023, you were arrested by the Plaquemine, Louisiana Sheriff's Office for domestic abuse battery you were charged with domestic abuse battery, first offense, but later pled guilty to the amended charge of disturbing the peace and was sentenced to 37 days parish prison, credit for time served uh, under Plaquemines docket number 23-04328. How do you plead to that charge? Not guilty. Okay. Uh, you're going to make a uh, not guilty with a statement? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Since I've been assigned your case, uh, and I'm going to tell you straight up from the get-go, you be honest today. Okay. All right? Yes, sir. It'll be totally honest. Okay. Tell me what happened with okay. this meth violence charge. Okay. I, I put my girlfriend out for another woman. And she got in her feeling and told me, say, well, before you move your new girlfriend in, first you got to get you out of jail. And she called the police and she just said, I hit her. And I was it. And I went to jail. And and that's what you have to say. That's it. That's it. And, and I went to jail. It just took okay. me. Okay. Let me, let me ask you this. Um, What about your best friend who said you did punch him? I can't, excuse me? They had a witness said that you did punch him. The witness that you said was going to say that you didn't said you did. I don't remember that. 
You don't know what's up with that. Yeah. And she claimed, she claimed you on the phone and you said, let me take care of this business and you punched her. No, sir. Never okay. happened. Okay, you denying uh, any of that ever happened? No, that never happened, sir. Okay, uh, do y'all still talk? Yes, sir. Y'all have any kids? No, sir. Well, why is she didn't want to come on today to speak on your behalf? She had wrote a letter already. She had worked. Okay. Uh, all right, I have no further questions. Ms. Renatza? I have no questions. Thank you. Mr. Prater? No, sir, I don't have any questions. Okay, uh, well, it's time to vote, so I'm going to vote. Uh, you know, you're in for manslaughter. Yeah. Oh, if you got you, your full term dates, what, in 33? Yes, 2033. And yet I asked you, please be honest. There's several witnesses said you punched that lady. How could that be? Well, I, I, I'm going to vote. Uh, I, I don't believe you're telling me the truth. My vote today is to revoke. Uh, Ms. Renatza? I do concur. My vote today also is to revoke. Mr. Prey. Concur with your decision. Revoke. Uh, the parole's been revoked. You'll get a letter in the mail telling you when you can reapply. That's the end of this hearing. Okay. The look on his face of complete shock and surprise when they revoked him was just odd for me. It's like he really thought he was going to get away with it by just pretending it didn't happen. It's like the ostrich putting its head in the sand. I I, I don't know. I mean, you know, the parole board, I think they wanted something. They wanted they didn't want to just say, wow, you're going to spend the next nine years in prison. And we don't have any information on his original charge, what he did, how long he served, when he got out. That information is not available, or I'm sure with certainty Richard would have found it and I'd be sharing it with you. But the bottom line is, is that he was backing nine more years and he will get another chance of parole. Again, that information is not clear either. We have seen folks after getting revoked, show up two years later. Don't know how long it will be for him. But to just, <laughs> you know, there's some type of sadness to it when they say, there's no one here in support of you. You know, his best friend rats him out. I wonder what he's doing now. And, and just the way it happened, I don't feel bad for him. You know, he says, I'm going to go take care of business. And he punches her in the face. It's like, just, you know, you deserve to get locked back up, frankly. And it's uh, it, for so many reasons. And um, but he says, no, uh, that's not what happened. That was another girl. And she she told him to get me locked up. And and you might be wondering, well, he, he got just disturbance of the peace. And is that really disturbance of the peace to get locked back up for nine years? But it's important to take a step back and remember that the DAs know that he's on uh, on, on parole and that it's much easier, not much, much easier. It's the, it's the easy thing to do. You might say the right thing to do to just give him time served because they know the parole board is going to revoke him and they're going to deal with him. So they don't need to worry about charges and witnesses and whatnot. So we see this quite often all the time, but we don't every day see someone who just says, ah, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. The witnesses, psh, no. Anyways, there you have it. We'll jump into another hearing. The prison I will be incarcerated in, not for 25 or even 40 years, but for the rest of my life. Jerry, as I said five years ago, I have forgiven you, but you still have a price to pay. You talk about me, the things you did to me, you've not mentioned once what you did to your own son and daughter. And it's up, it was disturbing to hear you say you were in a relationship with 11 or 12 year old girl. Do you recall that? 
Uh, yes, ma'am. You might remember this hearing because we did play it a year ago, but half of you or more haven't yet seen it. And I think it's noteworthy to share again. I'll unpack it with all the details, which we have at the end of the hearing. Classified as a first felony offender. Offenses aggravated incest, three counts. Sentencing date, February 11, 2002. Free sentence on March 17, 2003. Sentence to a total of 40 years. Parole date, September 25, 2011. Good time, not eligible. Full term, June 2, 2038. Is this information correct, sir? Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Pearl. Uh, thank you. Good morning. How you doing? Just fine. How about you, sir? I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. Uh, my name is Pearl Wise. I was assigned your case, so I'll be interviewing you first. I see you just had a, a birthday on the third. Happy belated birthday to you. Thank you, ma'am. You doing all right? Yes, ma'am. No, I'm nervous right now. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm trying to get you to relax. As you can tell, I'm, I'm uh, asking you some easy ones so you can relax. Uh, uh, is this your uh, this is your first hearing? Uh, no, ma'am. I went up in. Uh, January of uh, 2018. Okay, so this is your second here, January of 2018. Okay, uh, the, the, uh, I do want to inform you off the top, um, you do have law enforcement opposition to your early release. There's nothing you can do about it. I'm just gonna put it on the record. Uh, the DA's office, the Sheriff's Office, Police Department uh, opposed to your early release. Um, I saw in the record that you were listed as disabled. Uh, what's the nature of that? Is that correct? Uh, yes, ma'am. But see, I failed uh, back in '86. I fell 50 feet off of a hotel where I was working at. Okay. And I broke, I broke my back, stuff up. But I started having epileptic seizures, and I had seizures real bad all the way up until '96. Uh, okay. And mm -hmm. that's when I quit having them. Yeah. How you doing now? Well, I, I got a bunch of stuff wrong right now. I, I, they found out I got an enlarged heart. I've got diabetes. That and they say and the doctors are saying I got a outside of glaucoma mm -hmm. and I got uh, some skin cancer and stuff real bad. So they've had to do surgery on, on some of them. My, 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 my. Uh, so, how long have you served of this uh, 40 year sentence? 23 years and nine months. 23 years and nine months. And how old are you today? 62. 62. Okay. Um, uh, the details of this case are, you know, they're, they're quite troubling. The age of the victim, that's very troubling. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Have you had sex offender treatment? Have you had all those courses? Yes, ma'am. I took all of them and then I facilitated it for uh, going on 15 years now. 16 great, years. great. Because uh, Now, one of the things I read somewhere, I don't know if it was recent or, or since, because I saw that you were a facilitator, so that's why it was so concerning for me. It said that that you had said, like I said, I don't know when you stated this. I don't have a date attached to it. That uh, that you are having a consensual relationship with the victim, and that she was not a virgin, and and that uh, it, it was just a relationship. And it, it's some, it was disturbing to hear you say you were in a relationship with an eleven to twelve year old girl. Do you recall that? Uh, yes, ma'am. What do you say to that now, now that you are a sex offender treatment facilitator? What do you say to that now? Well, I mean, it was it was my fault, clearly. I mean, everything, it was it my fault. She had nothing, you know, it wasn't her fault at all. She had nothing to do with that. And I see that now, especially since I've gone through all the classes. And the main thing is, since I give my life to God, and I, I did that experience in God, and that was one of the best things i ever done. And God showed me, a lot of stuff about myself that needed to be changed, and he showed me how that I could change it, and gave me the gave me the tools of, through his word and the strength to be able to, to be able to do that. Better. And then the sex fist class helped a lot, I mean, a, whole, a whole lot. And the the real like the risk factors and all that they're good in telling you where you're at. But the, to me personally, the main thing that helps you the very most is the Rofo step, because if you really really truly don't want to be a, a defender again. Whenever you go out there on the street, do the Rocco scale, 
it shows you at any any moment what risk you are, whether you're in high, you know, a moderate risk, low risk, or high risk and stuff. And so, you as an individual, you know, you know your triggers. You know what what things is bad for you or not. And so, then you know not to be there. But if if you're in like if you're getting close to high risk, so you know you don't need to be there. If you're in a moderate risk. Best one to be in is you know, in a low, you know. Yes, sir. And so, and, uh, and you recognize that that's going to be for a lifetime. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It's going to yes. be for a lifetime. Yeah, that's uh, okay. Uh, and if you're successful today, your, your plan is to, is to move to, to Texas and live with your father. Uh, yes, ma'am. My dad, he's 86, 87 years old. He just had a birthday in February, but he's eighty seven. Okay, he, I had I had eighty three. All right, eighty seven. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, but he's in bad shape. He's uh, disabled. He's in a wheelchair. He lives alone. My mom, she passed away uh, five years ago. And so my dad, he lives all by himself. Now, I got two sisters, but they live over 100 something miles away from him. So they can't be there with him all the time to, you know, to help him whenever he needs help. So he's basically there by himself. And so I'm going to go there and, and stay with him and help him. And then I'm going to take over. He got a, a lawn care business of course he he ain't doing much now, he got a couple of guys still working for him but he's got all the equipment and everything that's needed and it won't be hard for me to <laughs> that, that's, that's in the record thank you sir that's in the record i, re I read that in the record uh, uh -huh. but, but with your health concerns and that's a, that's a whole nother concern as well the, uh, so call out for the record some of the other programs that you had I, I i saw you got your high school diploma and you got a technical trade as well in landscaping yeah. is that correct Yes, ma'am. In horticulture, yes, ma'am. Horticulture, yeah. I'm sorry, horticulture. So, what else? Just put on the record some of the programs you've had an opportunity to take. Okay, like I said, I've done Experience in God. I've done uh, the Timothy Club. I've done uh, Celebrating Recovery. I've done that for two years, three years. I went through three different times, and then uh, Bible storytelling. And uh, because I've done anger management. Advanced okay. anger management, stress management, advanced stress management. Good. I'm taking uh, the substance abuse class. And uh, uh, what, so, so I'm going to stop you right there. On the substance abuse, what was your drug of choice? Marijuana. Okay. So you you were high in, in all these encounters? You had smoked marijuana? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So that's one of your high triggers. You know that. Yeah. And, and praise God that. That I don't have the desire for the for the drug stuff anymore. I I can honestly say that that it's been over twenty four years now since I've since I've done any kind of drug or anything. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. All right, then. Um, that, that's all the questions I have. Uh, thank you for answering my questions. Uh, yes, Warden, what do you want to tell us? Uh, Jerry's record speaks for itself. You notice uh, y'all didn't mention the disciplinary record. He's been incarcerated for a number of years and. He hasn't had any disciplinary reports. Yeah, yet. that's true. I forgot. And I know he mentioned the fact that he's disabled, but he is able to do some uh, horticulture and landscaping work. He maintains a lot of the uh, uh, flower beds and stuff for us on the south compound. He does an excellent job. He's got really good work ethics and works very hard and and uh, maintaining those. He does work as a uh, facilitator in our sex offender treatment program as well, and has for for a while. I think those uh, comments you referenced, uh, uh, Ms. Wise, was, was in his uh, Static 99 interview. Okay, okay. Uh, in preparation for the pro hearing. So those were, uh, I think those were actually made in December of 2021 when he was interviewed by Mr. Hayden. All right. So, Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lord, for cleaning it up. Yes, ma'am. But, but he has an excellent history here at the institution and he does have a lot, several health issues he mentioned. Uh, you know, it was skin cancer and the glaucoma and the enlarged heart. All those things are true and accurate. He's been receiving treatment through LSU for, uh, and, and our medical department for those things as well. And he always has a good attitude and, and a really good uh, conduct history here. I don't have anything else to say. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Wise and Warden Goodwin. Um, Ms. Teresa, could you introduce the guests who have indicated they'd like to speak? First, we will hear from Mr. Terry Norman, who's a friend. Is it my turn? Yes, sir. 
I just want to say that uh, my dad and Jerry's dad were good friends, and I've known Jerry most all my life. And I know from just talking to him that he's changed and he's different. I know that uh, he never did anything like that before. And I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that he has been reformed. It's kind of short and sweet. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Mr. William McCorkle, brother-in-law. Mr. McCorkle, you can speak now. Is there a Miss McCorkle? Is that Reggie? Yes, ma'am. All right, well, can we move on, please? Apparently they've stepped away. For our opposition side, we will hear Ms. Stephanie. Um, I just want to start off. Thank you, board members, for allowing me to speak. I don't know if any of y'all were on the board five years ago, uh, but I'm a victim of sexual, physical, mental, and emotional abuse by Jerry. This abuse began as early as three years old. Uh, the physical abuse ranged from being thrown across the room to just being hit in places that the bruises could easily be covered up. Sexually, he had intercourse with me, put objects inside of me, videotaped me, and had other men have intercourse with me. All of this and so much more occurred to me as a young child beginning around four or five years old. His threats of killing me or my mother were real and very much believed. Today, Jerry is seeking to be released from prison, which basically is telling me that he feels he has paid his due for the horrendous things he did to me. It's ironic to me because he did not just hold me prisoner for around 10 years, but I continue to be in a prison. I'm stuck in a mental prison with memories, smells, sensations haunting me. Until I began a family of my own, I did not realize the impact that these things had and are continuing to have on me. I've had to start seeking counseling again to deal with my anger and feelings of inadequacy and even how to deal with my own emotions. I'm currently under the care of a neurologist and cardiologist to help with daily migraines, sleepless nights, passing out, irregular heart rhythms, all things that are a result from this prison he sent me to. The prison I will be incarcerated in, not for 25 or even 40 years, but for the rest of my life. Jerry, as I said five years ago, I have forgiven you but you still have a price to pay. You talk about me, the things you did to me, you've not mentioned once what you did to your own son and daughter. Board members, I hope you're able to read back over my testimony from five years ago, since I did go into more detail then than I am today. As I said then, I'll say now, I just hope as you consider your decision Consider what you would say or do if your daughter, sister, wife, granddaughter were sitting here. Imagine the tears, fears, nightmares that you sat and witnessed them to go through, have to process through, but you could do nothing to help. 
Imagine them spending the rest of their life in this prison of mental and ultimately of physical torture. Make your decision and just be prepared to share with your loved ones of why you made that decision. Thank you. All right, thank you, ma'am. Um, all right, Mr. Mosley, is there something you'd like to say to the panel before we vote and address your remarks to the panel members? Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay, now, like I said, I admit that, that I was wrong in, in what I've done, and, and it, was all, it was my fault. It wasn't, it wasn't Stephanie's. I've never tried to blame her or nothing else, but the thing of it is, I've never denied nothing that I've done, never. From day, from day one, I've never denied nothing that I've done. I've never held nobody captive. I've never picked her up, throw her across the room. I've never done nothing to uh, any of my bi biological children or nothing. And if I could change what happened between me and Stephanie, I'd change it in a heartbeat. I pray, I pray every day that God would touch her and, and give her peace and happiness in her life and heal her for the pain and stuff that I caused her. Because I know she had that she didn't deserve to go through the things that I put it through, of the, the sexual relationship that, that we had, but it is, as far as the abuse and stuff, it most definitely never, ever, had I ever sold her to anybody, ever thought about doing nothing like that, it wouldn't. But for what I've done, I, I deserve to be locked up. I'd be the first one to say that, that I deserve to be locked up. But in the time that I've been locked up, I've done everything that I possibly can to change me. From my heart, I've tried my level best to change. And the only way that I've been able to do that there is through the grace of God. God is the one who's changed me and give me the, the ability, the strength, the stuff, and the, the knowledge to know how to change. And after going through the sex fence class and stuff, I know that I'm not never going to put myself in no kind of predicament to be in a situation like that. Because I don't ever want to come back to no place like this. I never, ever do I want to come back. And I don't ever want to hurt nobody else ever again. And so I've, I've done everything that I can to make sure that I won't, that I, that I don't go out there and hurt anybody. I just want to be able to go out there, spend some time with my dad, what time my dad has left, and try to start a life for myself. That's all, that's all I've got to say. All right, good. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. I think the uh, panel's prepared to vote. We'll start with Ms. Wise. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mosley. Uh, uh, well said, sir. well said. And uh, uh, Miss Stephanie, uh, I appreciate your courage today. Uh, I think you're stronger than you realize that you are. Uh, Mr. Mosley, uh, at this time, and for me, for me, uh, at this time, my vote is to deny because of the law enforcement opposition and, and the, uh, the victim's opposition that's been expressed. I would like to see you take additional substance abuse treatment and additional victim awareness uh, programming. Uh, to, uh, but I, and I thank you for what the work you're doing uh, at the institution and I hope that will continue. Best wishes to you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Marabella. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I'd, I'd also like to echo uh, Ms. Wise's comments uh, to Ms. Harrington. Now, thank you very much for the courage to be here and to tell us uh, what you've told us here today. Uh, Mr. Mosley, uh, in looking at your, your record, uh, you've done a lot of very positive things. Uh, you've taken uh, all four phases of sex offender treatment and you've been a facilitator for what you say now is, is 15 years. Uh, but I have some grave concerns about the point Ms. Wise raised in, in, in kind of watching you just a few moments ago as well in your comments back in December of last year where you said this was a consensual relationship. Uh, this young girl was somewhere between 10 and 11 years old could not have possibly been a consensual relationship, legally or otherwise. And if you didn't learn that in all of your sex offender programs and you're facilitating, I'm concerned about that. Uh, I think you have a little more work to do. Uh, I think you need to, to be more aware and more in tune of what you've done to the victim in this case. 
Uh, my vote today is going to be to deny you as well. So good luck to you, and I encourage you to continue to work hard. Mr. Mosley, I uh, I do agree. Uh, the comments you made uh, are uh, are evident that your your understanding of what happened. Uh, you're not there yet. I think you still have some more work to do. I'm so glad that you are involved in the faith-based community and you have those tools that you're working with, but I still think you have a little more work to do. So I concur with my colleagues. My vote today is to deny your parole. And uh, I, I do echo Ms. Wise's suggestions about some additional uh, classes that would benefit you. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. cockroach you can't make it up the idea that just a year before this parole hearing in the interview process that they take he tells the interviewer that they were in a relationship thank you mr mirabella for calling it out there at the end and in his final statement, in his rant, when he went on, when he showed, you could see his anger coming out as much as he was trying to hold it in. I felt it. I saw it. He used the same words again. He said, I never threw her. I never hit her. I never sold her to anyone. I never touched my children. But we had a sexual relationship. Or he said, in the sexual relationship that we had, what? What? And you wouldn't believe it if you didn't see it. And, you know, I know we've seen hundreds of these. We've seen this already before, but it still never ceases to surprise me, to shock me, to, you know, think of the survivor came up there with her mic drop after mic drop, and she lays down the law. And if you're going to believe him over her, if you're not going to believe the facts that she laid out, that she's touching her, his own children, and, you know, on that note, so on that note, on that note, where where are his kids? Hmm? Where is his support? Hmm? He has the guy in the red shirt who shows up whose father was best friends with, with I guess, the guy, I don't know, like what the relationship was. So it's like, and then the other person doesn't show up. Thank goodness. For whatever reason, they walked out. It was the brother-in-law. I mean, you know, I think that's kind of what, what we needed to see there. If you had any doubt that he was doing this to his own children. And we'll go over the appeal that we have. I'm happy to let you know he's still locked up. He's still in prison. Thank goodness. And maybe we're going to see him up for parole sometime soon. You know, this hearing took place in 2022. It's June 28, 2024 at the time of this recording. I feel like there's lag. Um, and he was supposed the the prosecutor give the da credit i know we can't give them credit because they didn't show up they send their survivor here on her own you can only imagine what trauma this does to her she still spoke up like a survivor but <laughs> you 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 know the idea that she has to get a letter in the mail saying this roach is up for parole she doesn't know what the results are going to be you know, the, the, the bottom line is he got 40 year sentence, but parole eligibility after 10 years, and he's been parole eligible for a long time. And this was the second time she had to show up, and now she's gonna have to show up a third time, and who knows? And one day they yeah, they may release him, even though he's 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 facilitating the programs. He's facilitating the programs and he's still shows up and says that it was a relationship. Also, uh, Miss Wise interviewed, did you smoke marijuana? Yeah, yes, I did. That was all I did. It must have been your trigger. It must have been your trigger. It's like, 
you know, marijuana is like legal and basically like, like how many states now it's like, yeah, yeah. Marijuana turns everyone into roaches. That's, that's their trigger. It's just funny. I know. So this was decided October 23rd, 2002. So the facts of the case is that he, uh, uh, was married. They had three children together. He also had a daughter from a prior relationship. During the period from 1997 through 1998, um, when they were legally separated, mind you, and he had weekend visitation rights to all four of the children, Mosley confessed that over this time, so he's doing this just with his visitation rights, he engaged in sexual intercourse with his stepdaughter on at least three occasions. This is all he admitted to. We obviously... I'll believe everything the, the, the survivor says. She was 11 years old during the portion of this applicable time period when he was doing this. They don't talk about the other things that she brings up because, you know, they keep it simple. Um, in this indictment, of course, if they had brought up the other things, they'd have to prosecute those people. That would be complicated. How would they do that? So, you know, the DA is just going to stick with this. Mosley was indicted on, on these charges. The state notified the defense of his intent to seek the death penalty, and good for them. And that's that is the thing about the death penalty I, I want to bring up right now. When if 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 you ever find yourself in a debate arguing about the death penalty, and someone says, well, Why do it? Da, da, da. I what I've learned from this is that it is a tool that the DA has a powerful tool that they can come out and use to get plea deals. They got a 40 year sentence. They didn't need to put an 11 year old on the stand. And they were able to do that because they said, we're going to come out with the death penalty. So I think that's a good tool to have. If you're going to have a conversation as to why it's good, why it's powerful to still allow it. Because how many how many executions are actually going to happen these days, anyways? If someone's, and the, yeah, well, people don't like being on death row. So through a plea bargain, mostly entered a plea of guilty to three counts of aggravated. Um, and there we go, which are individually punishable by fine not to exceed fifty thousand or imprisonment with our labor not less than five years. Do you love the legislation here that that a judge would actually have been able to 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 sentence? five-year minimum, which we've seen, no more than 20 years. Why legislation would limit a judge to sentence for 20 years for doing this is insane also. But this judge, good for the judge, gave the maximum allowed, which was 20 years to be served concurrently. Um, I'm sorry, consecutively. I was like, what? To be served consecutively and the sentence on the count three to be served concurrently, which is 40 years. I was like, what is going on? I never misread that. Um, he said, hey, it's excessive. And they came back and said, no, it's not because the death penalty was on the table. And that was it. That's all we have in, in the appeal. Um, And, and good for the DA doing that. Of course, the DA should have shown up. Someone should have shown up to be with her, but I would think. And there you have it. Um, I don't know. Another thing, I know that I always get on Miss Wise's case, but I, I she ended up denying. She has her tactic, but I didn't like at the end of his speech how she said well said, well said. It's not well said. It wasn't well said. It was a horrible final wrapping up speech where he called the survivor a liar, essentially. Um, but it's interesting because I still have so much more respect for Miss Wise after, except for the cell phone thing. I'll never get over that. It's just, you know, but after seeing Iowa and some of these, even Utah, well, Utah, we don't really see the parole board, but Connecticut, it's like, anyway, so 
there we go. And now we'll move into the next hearing.